So what is a history whore? A history whore is somebody who uses their knowledge of history to push a political agenda and thereby to distort the truth. Now the man I'm accusing of being a history whore is Dominic Sandbrook. It's not the first time I've made a video on the, uh, the subject of Dominic Sandbrook because it's not the first time that he's been caught delivering hate speak about the baby boom generation. Here he's using the excuse, unbelievably, of the horsemeat scandal in order to have yet another go at the baby boom generation. The article is entitled, as you can see, The Unpalatable Truth. The horsemeat scandal is a brutal warning that Britain must change its ways. So he starts by talking about the fact that we have for many years not had a very good relationship in this country with food. There's nothing really wrong with that. Britain has never had a great reputation for cooking. He goes on to state the obvious. So when did the rot set in? Historians often blame World War II when the desperate demands of the crusade against Nazi Germany saw food rationing imposed on the British people. And certainly that did affect the availability of food. For example, the baby boomers, when they were young, had never seen broccoli. Uh, that was unheard of. We didn't have garlic, we didn't have olive oil. I don't remember pasta either, except in tins. I think tins of pasta were available. So how does he go on then to start to demonise the baby boom generation? Well, after acknowledging that part of the problem that the British people had in their love affair with uh, convenience food, uh, after acknowledging that that was partly as a result of the Second World War, he goes on to say, and I quote, but the other, I am sorry to say, was the sheer laziness and greed of the people who shopped in the supermarkets. Well, that, to my mind, is incredible, to make that jump in that way. It's almost as though the man was sitting in the bath and he suddenly thought, how can I drag the baby boomers into the horse meat scandal? You know, I'll get an article printed if I have a go at the baby boomers. I know that. So here goes. This is a good idea. He must have thought. Unbelievable. Laziness and greed of the people who shopped in the supermarkets. Now, this is the man who talks to us about greed, my friends. I don't like being unpleasant about somebody who's overweight, but this doesn't look like a man who can lecture us about eating healthy food. I don't think he's an advert for healthy food, and I don't believe he cooks healthy food. But, of course, he'd say that the fact that he has become overweight because he's only 38, remember, so he's incredibly overweight for 38. But he'd probably blame the baby boom generation for his love affair with unhealthy food. And then the poor dear goes on to say, Bitter experience has taught me that it is never wise to criticise the baby boomers, for never has there been a generation more sensitive to the slights of their successors. So in responding to this hate speak, we're told, are we, that we're just being sensitive. Tell me, Mr Sandbrook, can you explain to me which generation, which other generation, is uh, being criticised by the subsequent generation because I don't hear of that happening. Baby boomers didn't criticise the generation before them. I think it's only the baby boomers that are being targeted in this way. And as I'm going to explain in this video, there's a very clear-cut reason for that. Bitter experience has not taught you enough, it seems to me. I can't actually believe that baby boomers have uh, objected very much to what you've said because it seems to me that with the notable exception of myself, most baby boomers just seem to put up with everything. But I'm not going to do that. I've already made a video about you 
and presumably that's the bitter experience you're talking about, but obviously the experience isn't bitter enough. So the hate speak goes on. But it is an unarguable fact, he says, that the generation of the 1950s and 60s, who came of age at a time of full employment, soaring living standards and dizzying technological change, became used to getting everything they wanted, whenever they wanted it. Now this is very similar to what happened to the Jews in Nazi Germany, uh, where they were uh, vilified in this way. It's exactly the same, it seems to me. And uh, I'm going to argue with some of these so-called unarguable facts. He says, The baby boomers came of age at a time of full employment. Well, that's not actually true. The 1970s was a, an enormously deep recession. Probably not as deep as what we have now, but certainly at the stage we're at, uh, as I write this video, things were far, far worse. Uh, there was far more austerity in the 1970s than we're experiencing now, and there were no jobs. So this is just a pack of lies. This is ridiculous. It's simply not true. Uh, used to getting everything they wanted whenever they wanted it. What? I really don't think that compared with uh, what we have now where children in classes, and I can certainly vouch for this because I've seen it for myself, have £800 mobile phones. I really don't think that the baby boom generation were used to getting everything they wanted whenever they wanted it. A school trip for me was a trip to the local castle two miles down the road. We didn't go off on skiing holidays and things like that. Soaring living standards have, has come since, but then you were in nappies when I was actually experiencing the 1970s, so please don't tell me what it was like. You're talking rubbish. You're not a very good historian. A good historian would realise the importance of primary sources in trying to work out what an age was like, you know, before the, the historian was born. Uh, primary sources are absolutely crucial, Mr Sandbrook, and you may have interviewed primary sources for your books and your articles, but I think you've chosen the wealthier people of the 70s because this is not an accurate portrayal of what the 70s was like for most people. For example, I can remember when I was at university, uh, we had a, a tea party for the local city children and they turned up very, very dirty, very badly dressed. And uh, I spoke to somebody about this and they said, well, these people are so poor that they really cannot afford to keep their clothes clean. We don't have that really now, not yet anyway. We don't have it at the moment and we did have it in the 70s. Uh, contrary to the impression that's continually been given that everything was wonderful and people were living in the lap of luxury. And one of the things I really dislike is hypocrisy. And this man is berating the baby boomers for, uh, according to him, having a, a, a wonderful, luxurious lifestyle, living in the lap of luxury. But if you look up his history, you will see on Wikipedia that the first school he went to was this school, Birchfield, which, as you can see, is a public school, fee-paying, presumably, and quite luxurious. And he went on from there to Malvern College, which is even more luxurious by the look of it, again, a public school. So he has lived an incredibly privileged existence, and yet he s thinks it's appropriate to be criticising people, many of them having gone to state schools that are maybe not particularly good. I'm not saying that comprehensives are necessarily bad, but some comprehensives have been very, very bad indeed. I don't actually say this out of envy for him because, judging by the article he's written, which I think is a very low standard, I think a grammar school, a state grammar school such as the one I went to, provided a far better education. But 
the fact remains that this man should not be talking to other people about being spoiled. So going on with the hypocrisy, this is where he lived, a place called Chipping Norton, and uh, some of the famous residents are Ronnie Barker, Rebecca Brooks, Jeremy Clarkson, and many others, of course. And you can see Dominic Sandbrook there highlighted too. It says at the end, some current famous residents of the town and its local area, including David Cameron, whose constituency home is in nearby Dean, are commonly, commonly referred to as the Chipping Norton set by the British media. So this is a very affluent area. And there's nothing wrong with that, but when this man characterizes an entire generation as spoiled and he's living this lifestyle, this is hypocrisy, my friends. And it's interesting that Jeremy Clarkson should be one of the residents of Chipping Norton. Jeremy Clarkson is famous for having said that teachers should be put up against a wall and shot. A shot in front of their families, he said, for the crime of having gone on strike for a day as protest against the wholesale theft of their pensions that they'd worked for all their lives by people who are probably now residents of Chipping Norton. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if Jeremy Clarkson was one of the primary sources used by Dominic Sandbrook. One more matter to deal with before I go on to analyse the content of this article. One more comment to make about the hypocrisy that Dominic Sandbrook shows. He's written an autobiographical spiel, and usually when you read something which is uh, autobiography, you have to read between the, the lines. I nearly said read between the lies. And it's quite interesting because he says that after he did his PhD, he went on to be a lecturer in history at the University of Sheffield, he said. And he says, after three years, however, I got itchy feet. I had already been given a contract to write a three-volume history of modern Britain, and I was tired of the bureaucratic demands of university life. So this man who worked for three years, he's 38 and he's only worked, as far as I can see, for three years, although he does write books as well, but uh, actually holding down a job, he couldn't hack it for more than three years. That's how I interpret it when he says he got itchy feet. And of course he was uh, commissioned to write the three-volume history of modern Britain because he was writing exactly what the global elite wanted to see written. So he was serving their agenda basically. But as far as working, he can't really claim to be able to describe baby boomers, many of whom worked all their lives and held down a job for 30 or 40 years, he can't really justifiably claim they are lazy. Turning now to the content of what he writes, he basically says that the love affair that the British have with uh, fast food is the fault of the baby boom generation. Uh, there's, there isn't really very much more to his argument than that. It's just uh, an attempt to vilify an entire generation of people. And it's quite interesting that he's supposed to be a historian, he's supposed to have an intellect, but he's actually fallen for this division of people into 18-year age groups, which are characterised with uh, generation names and these have obviously this has obviously been invented by the global elite in order to set one set of people up against the other and he is pandering to that there is nothing more in his article no more depth of analysis than that it's pathetic so i'm going to do my own analysis of why this has happened the first thing that happened in the 70s that was really very, very important was that uh, women went out to work en masse. And the reason they went out to work was not uh, through choice. They did so because the man's salary could no longer support a couple. 
They were forced out into the workplace, in other words. And if you listen to Aaron Russo, who is dead now, very sadly, but he once gave an interview in which he talked about his friendship with one of the Rockefellers. And this Rockefeller told him that the global elite had uh, deliberately sent women into the workplace place because they realized that they could get twice the taxes etc so the baby boomers were the victims of this but now they're being uh, criticized for it dominic sandbrook does mention the fact that women went uh, out into the workplace but he doesn't really make very much of it because of course he doesn't really understand that if a woman does not have help in the home uh, particularly if she's got young children, if she goes out into the workplace, she really doesn't have very much time for cooking. And that was an enormously important factor, but he just skirts over it because he's just not mature enough to uh, make a, a, um, a reasonable judgment. He needs to mature a lot before he can call himself a historian. The next thing that happened, uh, which was of importance, of course, was the emergence of supermarkets and uh, with them fast food. Dominic Sandbrook does mention this en passant, but he doesn't really make very much of it. But it was extremely important because the way I remember it was that the small shops simply disappeared at that time. Small shops were actually very convenient for uh, people of my parents' generation. And I know that because I was the person that was sent up to the shops every week with a list, with lists. I, I had f three lists, one for the butchers, one for the grocers, and one for the green grocers. And I would deliver those lists and I would buy some bread and incidentally have to account for every penny of the change. And then the food would be duly delivered by van. That luxury, and it was a luxury, I think, it was much easier that way, disappeared in the 70s. And you had the emergence of supermarkets and fast food in the supermarkets instead. Now, unlike Dominic Sandbrook, who seems to think that just sort of happened, I think it happened for a reason, and the reason was quite simple. In the 70s, contrary to what Dominic Sandbrook claims, there was a recession. People were very short of money. And so when the supermarkets, with their economies of scale, came along, they were able to offer the food at a much cheaper rate. And desperate families uh, therefore went to the supermarket. At least that's how I think it happened. I don't really know what it was that uh, caused uh, supermarkets to appear. But as they appeared, the small shops all disappeared. But the supermarkets, as I remember it, came along very, very gradually. And the fast food that came with them came very, very gradually. And most people I was a young married woman at the time and I didn't, well, very rarely cooked convenience food. I usually cooked from raw ingredients and I can honestly say that uh, during my whole lifetime I've hardly ever had beef burgers, only when my children dragged me to McDonald's. So he's generalizing about people born in this 18 year period and saying they're all they were all eating fast food it's it's just rubbish. One of the things which Dominic Sandbrook fails to mention and I think it shows that he's a very poor historian the fact that he doesn't mention it is that during the 70s there was a 28% inflation 28%. Now what that means is that within 2.8 years anybody on a pension or fix, uh, any fixed income uh, would find that their income would halve. And for people who were had families, for example, uh, it was very difficult because the wages were not keeping up with this inflation. 28% is very, very fast rate of inflation. I think we're going to get worse with this recession, but we haven't had it yet. 
And this very privileged young historian doesn't seem to believe, he's very dismissive of the idea that anybody could have found it difficult to cook from raw ingredients. He doesn't seem to accept the fact that there were some people who really were struggling in this very bad recession that we had in the 70s. And of course, he doesn't place any emphasis on the fact that the supermarkets took advantage of this. They were going to benefit, obviously, from having food on the shelves for lengthy periods of time, as were the companies, the manufacturers of the food. And the fact that the manufacturers could put cheaper ingredients in uh, was also benefiting the manufacturers. But this young historian, as he calls himself, uh, seems to th to be blaming the victims of this <laughs> rather than the perpetrators of the crime because it was a crime because eventually it has destroyed the health of the population of this country and other countries. And incidentally, the other thing I would notice about what happened at that time, because I spent some time in France as well, is that this w happened much slower in France. England is the belly of the beast and it happened there much quicker, but it did eventually happen in France as well. If you visit France now, unless you have a lot of money to spend, you can't eat very well. All you can get is stuff with cheese in it, very fattening stuff, but you can't eat really good food as you used to be able to in the late 60s, early 70s. And talking about France, Dominic Sandbrook surprisingly doesn't mention the, f the fact that horse meat is not uh, per se an inferior meat. The French have always eaten horse meat. He should know that because according to Wikipedia he spent some time in France. Uh, there's such a thing as the Boucherie Chevaline which was there in the uh, 60s and 70s as well. And uh, I remember when I was about 15 or 16 and I went to stay with my French pen friend in Versailles, I was given horse meat. I didn't know I was eating it. I thought it was quite tasty, actually. I remember commenting to my pen friend's mother that uh, I'd enjoyed the meal and I asked her what it was. I was quite horrified when I found it was horse meat. So horse meat itself is not an inferior meat necessarily and probably would have been even healthier than beef because beef is nowadays pumped full of antibiotics, growth hormone, that sort of thing. The only reservation you could have about the horse meat being introduced was firstly they were not telling the public that it was horse meat and secondly some people don't like the idea of eating horse meat because they are horse lovers and thirdly there could have been some residue of drugs inside the horse meat. Now Dominic Sandbrook doesn't mention any of this. He suggests that we were passed on horse meat because of the baby boomers. I'm not quite sure how the baby boomers caused the horse meat scandal, but he seems to have linked the two somehow. I, he must have really thought this up in the bath, I think. Now, if Dominic Sandbrook were a good historian, he would try to analyse why it was that Findus beef products contained horse meat all of a sudden. And I think you find that the answer is because it was cheaper. And I'm going to explain why this meat, which is not actually inferior to beef, was cheaper. So this strikes me as likely to be the reason. It says, in 2007, as part of efforts to bring Romania in step with European Union law, the country banned horse-drawn carts from main roads in cities and towns. Horse has been intrinsic to Romanian life, pulling carts through the streets or working the fields. Following the ban, countless numbers of stray horses have been abandoned. Starving in and nowhere to go, they roam the streets and parks of Romania's major cities.
Consequently, the emaciated horses are rounded up and if, if left unclaimed, almost all are, they are sent to slaughterhouses. Abandoned animals aside, poor Romanians are selling their horses to slaughterhouses because they can't afford to keep them. The monthly income of subsistence farmers in the countryside is less than the cost of feeding a horse for that period. So my guess is that there was uh, an effort on the part of the European Union to introduce debt into the Romanian economy. That's what's happened in many, many countries. What they do is they get people into debt and uh, then, of course, they make a killing. The bankers make a killing out of it. And so that is the reason why there are so many horses available for slaughter and why the meat is so cheap. So, while the poor Romanians are busy acquiring debt, the British have already been manipulated, many of the British at least, into acquiring debt. And they're now at the stage where the bankers are printing money. So the result of that, of course, will be that there'll be rampant inflation. And then the establishment will be able to swoop in and acquire all the assets. For example, is it a coincidence that they're now starting to offer equity release schemes? Uh, you know, the idea is first you stress the baby boomers and then you swoop in and acquire their assets by offering them equity release schemes. It's a game, Mr. Sandbrook, and a well-known game. The printing of money increases the money supply, and the definition of inflation is an increase in the money supply. The first signs of inflation are not rising prices. The first signs of inflation are smaller packet sizes and inferior ingredients, cheaper ingredients, so that the big corporations can reduce their cost. So there's your reason for the horse meat scandal, Mr. Sandbrook. But you didn't even bother to mention inflation. And while I'm mentioning inflation, can I just remind you that any good historian knows that history repeats itself. And it's no coincidence that we're having cheaper ingredients now as inflation comes into the picture. And the cheaper ingredients came in in the 70s, not because the baby boomers were lazy and greedy and spoiled, but because they were having to contend with inflation at 28%. And yet you never mentioned it. But if your only misdeed was to indulge in a bit of hate speak about the baby boomers, that would be one thing, and it probably wouldn't have prompted me to make this video. No, Mr. Sandbrook, what you have done by uh, acting as a history whore is far more dangerous than that. You're indulging in hate speak at a time when academics, and you must know this because you're an academic yourself, and others, such as Ted Turner, are openly and seriously talking about the mass murder of not millions of people, but billions of people. This isn't a conspiracy theory. It's conspiracy fact. Now, I want you to see and understand the big picture. Yes, the global elite are targeting the baby boomers at the moment because they've stolen the pensions and they know that they stole pensions which should have sustained the generation in view of the fact that for the first time in history both members of a couple paid into the pension funds because both members went out to work. That means that the pension funds were twice the size for every couple as they were for the previous generation. This is never mentioned by academics like yourself or by the prostitute media. So yes, 
They want to demonize the victims of the economic collapse as an excuse for the theft of everything they worked for. But if you think they're just going to kill off a generation of baby boomers, you're wrong. They're after population reduction on a big scale. And that means people like you, Mr. Sandbrook. At 38, your wife would probably be considered to be of childbearing age. And so the message really is, this involves everybody except the 0.00 whatever it is percent of the top elite. We need to boycott the BBC, boycott newspapers like the Daily Mail and good journalists at the Daily Mail, because there are good some good journalists at the Daily Mail, people like David Rose, for example, I've read some of his articles and they've been very good, need to jump ship and start working for the alternative media. We need to boycott elections too. Baby boomers, they're trying to murder you. Get that into your heads. They've already started with a soft kill operation the Liverpool Care Pathway, geoengineering the skies, GM food, but they're planning much, much more. You'd better hope, Mr Sandbrook, that your team wins, because if the population ever wakes up, just remember what they did in the past to collaborators.